Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings as we continue our study of Elijah. Today we're looking at Elijah the rabble rouser. 1 Kings chapter 18. Again, I want to encourage you to bring your Bibles with you. If you do not have a Bible, please let me know. I'd love to give you a free copy of God's Word. We're going to be using it quite a bit today. It's not as many as going to be on the monitor. And it's always good to just bring that with you and just always have it open as you're taking notes and making uh, observations and things of that, known, that nature. Let me ask you, have you ever known someone that was a rabble rouser? Now, if you know Mike Smith, you, you be Mike Smith, he may, he may kind of make you think that he's just a quiet old gentleman, but uh, without that cane, he's a rabble rouser. When I think of a rabble rouser, I think of someone like, I think back into the 90s of the Bulls. Anybody remember Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, you know, Scotty Pippen? You can tell we're from the Midwest. But they had, they had Dennis Rodman. Six foot eight, he was known as the worm. He was the one with the colorful hair and his life now has just gone into a mess. But he was a rabble rouser. He was someone whose, whose skills were not very tall, but he was kind of muscular. But he would just get under the other person's skin. And before you know it, they would be pushing him, hitting him, getting all sorts of trouble. And he would just follow him out or he would just, he was one of those guys that just made trouble. And so, you know, we always know those people who just kind of get themselves just under your skin or they stand out. They're always making trouble. Well, Dennis Rodman was an equal opportunity offender. And in our passage last week, Elijah, we saw, was sent into the heartland of Baal worship where God displayed his presence, his power, his mercy and his grace to a poor widow who was not seeking him at all. We saw that God displayed his presence through the ministry of Elijah. He displayed his power through his sovereign control over nature in allowing the, the oil and the flour not to dis dissipate, but to always to be full. He displayed his mercy by providing substance to the Gentile woman. And he displayed his grace by granting her her son's life. But also it seems a new heart to the widow as she came to understand who Yahweh was, who the Lord was, who God was. The narrative today now moves on to the eve of the cosmic battle of Elijah versus Baal. It's one of the most dramatic, most favorite, and most miraculous event ever recorded in Scripture. But before we get to that, I know some of you might have been excited that we're going to get to that part today. But before we get to that famous passage, we're introduced to some more, several more characters in this evolving narrative. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18, hopefully you're there. The next two verses will be on the monitor just to get, your, get it wet here and get our feet going. It says, After many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was very severe, or was severe in Samaria. Father, as we come before you, I echo the words <coughs> of Randy, and let my lips speak the truth. Lord, let us know the difference between my mere opinion, which will show up, and also the truth of your word. May they connect, but Lord, give us discernment. And Father, most of all, I pray that you open our hearts to receive what you have through the life and ministry of Elijah. Father, that we can take an event that happened 3,000 years ago, but then put it now to our now, here, and day, and how we should live. So I pray that your spirit would have free work, and that we will respond to how your spirit calls us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, I want to give you my apologies. This has been a tough year. Again, I'm fighting a cold and a cough, so you'll hear me do that. <coughs> I'll try to make them. So pray for me silently as we go through this. But this morning, I want to take some time before getting into that cosmic battle to consider both the setting and the character of this momentous event, this battle between Yahweh and Baal. First, we're going to examine the setting of this narrative. After more than three years, Yahweh sends Elijah back to Ahab to inform him that, the, that he will end the drought and bring the much-needed rain that those states desperately need. The drought had caused a region-wide famine, as we saw last week, that had devastated the land. And King Ahab is sending out his servants to search for grazing areas for the livestock. And we, in verse 5, we read of Ahab's plan. In verse 5, Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of the water and to all the valleys. 
Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and the mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. They're trying to save the cattle, the horses, and the sheep. So King Ahab summons his chief of staff, so to speak, to inform him that they're going to scour the land to find the precious resources, water, and grazing land that their cattle, their sheep, and their horses need to survive. Now, this is important. You know, we understand that they needed food for, for people, but their beast of burdens, the mules, they needed that grazing land. They needed it for their horses so they could defend against battle. They needed it for their cattle and their goats, for the milk, the cheeses, and even the meats that they need. So their animals here need grazing land and more water. But as we continue in verse 7, we read that in his journey, Obadiah, the, the, chief, the king's chief of staff, he encounters Elijah. And let's look at that encounter in verse 7. As Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is. It is I. Go and tell your lord, lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now, we're going to look at the rest of the conversation in a minute. But as we read in verse 16, go down to verse 16. So Obadiah went to Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Though three and a, year, three and a half years have passed, with no drain, no dew, causing a devastating drought and a dangerous famine, we read that Ahab still has not repented, and instead he doubles down against the man of God, as he we see he gives him an insult in verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? Now just think about that a moment. Three and a half years ago, Elijah comes into the court of the king and says, because of your rejection of God, because of your worship of Baal, because of your marriage to Jezebel, because of your wickedness, there will be no rain, no dew for three years. Well, he didn't give him a time. He just says there's going to be no rain or no dew on the ground. It comes in effect. And he doesn't see Elijah for three and a half years. And he sees the devastating effects of the drought that brings a famine throughout his land. But yet when he sees Elijah, it's not one of repentance. It's not one of saying, you were right. You serve the one true living God. No, it's to call him, you are the troubler of Israel. Talk about a warped view of the circumstances. Yet Elijah shows the courage of his convictions when he replies in verse 18. I have not troubled Israel, Elijah says, but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and you have followed after Baal. Like most people, Ahab tries to distract, to distort and divert attention to his, from his own sin and the consequences it brings to others. And you and I do that very often, many times ourselves, most likely all the time. When the consequences of our sin start to come in, when we realize that we're not getting away with our rejection of God, of pursuing our own passions, we begin to divert, distract, and point to others, to blame someone else, to point to a circumstance, and say, it must be them. They're the troubler of my life. However, Elijah doesn't play that game. But he boldly calls him out. He doesn't allow Elijah or allows King Ahab to play that game. In verse 19, we read of Elijah's challenge. Now therefore sin and gather all of Israel to me at Mount Carmel. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and he gathered the prophets together there at Mount Carmel. Elijah points out that there are 850 prophets of the false gods. We even see that these prophets are highly regarded as Elijah describes them as those who eat at Jezebel's table. They have a place of honor. So as we look at this setting, we see that after three and a half years, things are finally coming to a head. 
as Elijah courageously obeys God's word and confronts the prophet of Baal with a challenge. I now want to take a moment now and look at and examine the different characters that are coming into play in this narrative. Again, as we read this portion of scripture, we can quickly go through this narrative just to get to the, the battle. You know, to get to the, to the offerings and the fire that comes down from heaven. But we need to understand that these are in here for a purpose. And so these characters, I believe, are something important for us to consider. So first, character we're going to see is Lord, is Yahweh, is God. He's the one true living God who is sovereign over all of creation, who alone deserves all worship. Now that should bring an amen. Let me try it again. The first character is the Lord, the Yahweh, the one true living God who is sovereign over all of creation and who alone deserves our worship. Amen. Amen. Okay, very good. In Exodus 20, what we're going to teach you, we're going to get it. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2, we, read that, we had read that God had given the children of Israel this command. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery, you shall have what? No other gods before me. You should not make for yourselves a card image or a likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is that in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So the first character we have to understand is the Lord. Now, Yahweh has displayed his presence, his power, his mercy, and his grace throughout this narrative, as we've read Elijah. He is demonstrating that he alone is the sovereign, providential God, and that Baal is a worthless, false God. The second character is Elijah. He's the prophet of God who courageously serves God in the face of the danger and diversity. The, through most, or, or, or diversity. Though much is not known about him, the scripture doesn't give us much about who he is or where he is from, other than from that one city. He stands head and shoulders among the prophets of the Old Testament. And we know that he is one that God said one will come like him to prepare the way of the Lord that we now know as John the Baptist. So Elijah, as we saw in our first week message, is larger than life. The third character is King Ahab. He's that wicked king of Israel. The northern ten kingdoms who had abandoned God of Israel. And he placated his wife by worshiping the false god Baal. In doing so, he not only has he incurred the judgment of God and personally responsible for the suffering of tens of thousands of people, he has ignored the one job he was commanded to do. You've seen that. You had one job, right? He had one job. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 17, if you want to turn there, if you real quickly. Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Old Testament. In that passage, we read Yahweh's commands to the children of Israel when it came time to appoint a king. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, he says, And when that king sets on the throne of the kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law. What law? The one that we read earlier. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. It should be approved by the Levitical priest. In other words, he doesn't write what he wants, but he has to write one that, 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 that's true, that's real, and it's going to be checked. In verse 19, it says, And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life. Why? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of his law and statutes by doing them. So he was to write a copy of the law for his own. He was to read it and to internalize it and bring it to his heart. It says that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from his commandment either to the right or to the left so that he may continue long in the kingdom, he and his children in Israel. One job. Write down the book of the law. Read it all your days. Follow it. Lead your people and God will bless him. Well, King Ahab failed at that one job. Very quickly, ruthlessly. Queen Jezebel, another character. She's the evil wife of the king. She's a Gentile. She's a worshiper of a Baal. She had killed many of the prophets of God. She is, a worth, she is worthless as a wife and as a queen. 
In direct opposition to Yahweh and his prophets, we read that she has taken special care of the prophets of Baal while working to cut off the prophets of the Lord. She esteems and honors the false prophets while murdering, slaughtering those who truly are prophets of the one true living God. She truly was a wicked woman. Now we're introduced to a character we haven't seen before in chapter 18, and that's Obadiah. Now this is not the Obadiah that wrote the book of Obadiah later, the prophet Obadiah. This is a servant of the king who oversaw the king's affair. He was the chief of staff. He's new to the narrative, and we read that Obadiah was a conflicted man in this passage. He was a man of competing fears. First, we see in verse 3 that he feared God, which he should. Look at verse 3. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over his household. Now look at in the parentheses, this little note. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Amen. And when Jezebel had cut off the prophets of the Lord that I've spoken of earlier, when she had killed them, Obadiah took a hundred of the prophets and he hid them by fifties in a cave and he fed them with bread and water. So you can imagine, here he is, he's in the king's court. He hears that she's ready to murder these prophets. So he finds a hundred of them because he fears God. He's a God worshiper. And he takes them and he takes them and splits them in half and says, I'm going to put some of you in a cave and I'm going to put 50 of you in a cave. Not only does that, he takes the precious water and food probably from the king's court, from the king's house, and he sneaks in and he would give them food and water. So in here we see he is a man who fears God. He does a very courageous thing in doing it. If he was to be caught by Ahab or Jezebel or given over, his life would be forfeit as well. However, not only was he a man who feared God, but we go in verse 9, we see that he feared King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. As probably most of us would, rightly so. Look at verse 9. And this is when he comes up to Elijah. And this is that conversation we skipped earlier. He says to Elijah, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of King Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord is not sent to seek you out. King Ahab has been looking for Elijah these last three and a half years. And when they would say, He is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. Verse 11. And now you are telling me, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you not where I know where you are. No, he's afraid that Elijah is going to disappear. And so when I come and tell Ahab and I, he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophet by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? Verse 14. And now here you are saying, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He'll kill me. I don't blame Obadiah here. I don't think any of us should be too harsh on him. This is how you and I are. We fear God, but yet we fear man. This, this is a real life thing that's going on here. But Elijah encourages him by declaring in verse 15, As the Lord of hosts lives, behold, or before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him. Uh, we can't be too harsh with Obadiah. We must admit that he was a man torn between two powerful forces. Then there's the prophet of Baal and Ashereth. He mentions, Elijah mentions, that there's 850 of them that serve to lead, the, to lead the people astray. And as we know from the next passage, they're living on the hog, and they're going to meet a very deserving end. But lastly, <coughs> excuse me, we read of the people of Israel. Up until this point, they, they had been a silent uh, uh, background. But then all of a sudden, we see, the, we see the people of Israel who are coming to Mount Carmel. Now, we're not told how many accepted the king's invitation but we read that a group of them came to Mark Carmel to see what was going on. Everyone likes a good show. Elijah's coming. He's facing Ahab. We got to see what's going on here. They are not painted, though, in a very good light as Elijah both challenges and condemns them with a simple question in verse 13. Look at verse 13. 
Elijah asked them this a simple question. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Underline that, highlight, do something there. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Now, I love the word picture drawn in this verse. Go limping between different opinions. Elijah recognizes that the children of Israel are in need of a heart adjustment. It seems that they are intertwining their worship of Yahweh with the practices of Baal worship. It's similar to what their ancestors did in the wilderness with the golden calf. Elijah simply points out their error and sin, and he commands them to make a choice. You cannot add uh, false gods and false worship to the worship of the one true God. He says, if the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal, follow him. Him. Make a choice. You cannot serve both. This is a choice is the same that Joshua made to the people after conquering Canaan and before his death in Joshua 24, 14. When Joshua said, Therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Elijah's given them the same challenge that Joshua gave them centuries before. Now their answer is simply awestrucking and sad at the same time. The narrator records that instead of answering how their ancestors who proclaimed to Joshua, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, we will serve God. Listen to what it says that they said. The people did not answer him, what? A word. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Either serve God or serve Baal. Crickets. Silence. Unsurprisingly, Elijah declares in verse 22, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Once again, it seems like Elijah is overmatched that he is all alone in honoring Yahweh and standing for the truth. Yes, it's true that Obadiah mentioned that there were a hundred prophets of God, but they are in hiding for their lives. They're nowhere near this scene. So in summary, as we just consider the new characters, all the characters in this narrative, we see that Elijah is all alone in his defense of God. Of course, we know that though the odds seem stacked against him, God will once again demonstrate his presence and power. But as we come to this narrative, he once again stands alone. Now, I wanted to take this week to take this time to consider both the settings and the characters that make up this cosmic battle between Yahweh and Baal. And I believe there's some lessons for you and I to dwell upon just in the setting and the character and not just the big story that's about to follow. First, in considering the setting, we can easily understand how though the time, the terrain, the culture, and the populace is different than from ours today, there is still much that is the same. You see, just as Elijah lived in a hostile environment that openly rebelled against God, so do you and I. Is that not true? Our political, social, and cultural leaders are trying to do outdo each other, are trying to outdo each other in pursuing absurdity after absurdity in bowing down to the false gods of self-satisfaction, self-preservation, and self-actualization. It is just ridiculous what they're trying to do. It seems like there is no boundary to this world's pursuit of all things decadent. We are in a bullet train trying to go to the most depraved place that you and I can go to. They have abandoned any semblance of truth 
and have dedicated themselves to the futile race after relative truth. But before you and I can be too critical, and before you and I can judge our leaders, we too are like people limping between opinions. The effects of this rebellion and sin is just as devastating as the drought and famine of 3,000 years ago. There is a drought and famine of truth-telling and worship of the one true living God today that has left this world in hunger and thirst. And any attempt, here's where you and I have to understand our setting today, is that any attempt by Christ followers to proclaim the truth of God's word leads the world to cry out that we are troublers, that we are rabble-rousers, that we must be ignored, quieted, and dismissed. Here in the U.S., they are seeking to legislate us out of the public square. But in many parts of the world, they are imprisoning Christians and slaughtering them to appease their guilty conscience. In Taylor Swift's new song, Calm Down, I know there's a chuckle there. She sings of those who are against the agenda of the world, saying you need to calm down, you're being too loud. Who is she saying this to? Those who speak God's truth. She's saying you are too loud. You just need to calm down. You just need to stop. Can you stop? She sings, like, can you just not step down on our gowns? You need to calm down. Why are you troubling the world, Christians? Just be quiet. Do not stand against what we're trying to do. Now, this setting should not be a surprise to any of us. As Jesus warned in our scripture reading earlier that Landon gave us, Behold, I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you. They will drag you before governors and for my sake to bear witness of me. In that same re reading, he had warned the disciples that we will be hated for Christ's name's sake. And in the book of Acts, the good Dr. Luke records that the apostles suffered much for the sake of Christ. It's in its pages of, 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 of Acts that we read that the apostles were beaten, imprisoned, stoned, and charged as being rioters, turning the city upside down and being atheists. They were the rabble rousers, the troublers of the world. In short, they were rabble rousers by proclaiming Christ crucified. And so be not surprised or be not surprised when the world too considers you a rabble rouser, a troubler, one who's creating waves, whether it's at work or in your school, in your neighborhood, when you stand for the things of Christ. So that's our setting. You and I very much live in a King Ahab type world, one that's rejected the truth of God and the rule of the one true God. <clears throat> Which brings us to the second consideration, that is characters. As you read this story, I don't know if you're a reader. Do you like to read fiction? I love it. It's not uncommon for those who read to kind of put themselves as a character in the book or to identify with one of the characters. So as you read through this, let me ask you, which character do you identify with the most? Now, for most of us, we automatically imagine ourselves as Elijah. I'm the one standing alone for God. Just as we do with, I'm like David, I'm like uh, Moses, you know, I'm Daniel, I'm the three children, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I'm the one standing for God. We tend to think that if you and I were in the same setting and circumstances, that you and I would stand firm and grounded in the faith. That's what we want to think of ourselves. Yet here we are today faced with not the exact same circumstances, but still very close with the still the opportunity to stand firm and grounded in our faith in a world that is hostile to our faith and to our God. 
But if you and I are honest, we find that we are not Elijah. So let me ask you, so are you more like King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and the false prophets? Are you here this morning and listen to what I say, please? Are you here this morning pursuing your own passions and your own selfish desires? Have you rejected the authority of God and his word when it comes to your relationships, to your finances, and to your life, and to your worldview? Do you not recognize the presence and power of the sovereign God? Do you dismiss the grace and mercy of the providential God, taking it for granted of your breath and of your life? Do you entice others to follow you in denying God's word? I pray here, if your heart is far from God, would you repent today? Don't divert, don't distract, but would you come and just repent and recognize that there is a famine and a drought in your life and your heart. And Jesus has come to me, for you will never hunger, and I will give you a water which will never cause you to thirst. Come to him today. Recognize that he is the one true living God. Reject the false gods that you've been worshiping. And we all are worshiping false gods. John Calvin said that our heart is an idol worshiping factory. We make all sorts of things to worship. Maybe you're the prophets in hiding. You fear God, you love God, but you're not engaging in the world. You're hiding out. Things have gotten so tough that you're like, you know what, I'm just going to go make my own little life, my own little world. And there are many Christians who go and do that. There was a time in the 80s when I remember that Christians were going to make their own bowling alleys, their own movie theaters, and we even made our own little theme park. So we don't have to engage with the world. Let it go to hell in a handbasket. We'll just stand back here and just be happy. Are you just hiding out? Not engaging. Listening and watching all that goes around you and just saying, nah, I don't want, it doesn't have anything to do with me. So many times that's where we are. We think, how has the world gotten so bad? Well, where are the Christians? Where's the Elijah's? Where's the men standing up, the women standing up? Well, we've been in hiding. We're in our holy huddles in our churches, protecting our families. Or are you more like Obadiah? You fear God, you desire to obey him, but you also fear the response of man. And I believe this is where most you and I live. We're more like Obadiah's. Are you a secret agent that serves God while not bringing attention to your faith? Do you find yourself struggling to serve two masters? You're afraid to witness or to share your faith? Do you fear the ridicule, the rejection, and the responses of those who are opposed to God? And when I mean secret agents, you know, we're just there and, we, you know, we allow people to go and we just don't want to, we don't really want to share our faith. Every once in a while, we may go to our church, we may go to our small groups, we may read our Bibles, but when we get into the public sphere in our neighborhood, anyone else, then we just try to be like them. Would your friends be surprised to know that you follow Christ? Would they be surprised to know that you go to church? Would your friends, if I were to go there and they'd say, hey, do you know that he's a worshiper of God? They'd say, what? What do you mean? Or are you more like the people of Israel? Are you limping between loving God and pursuing your own passions? Thinking that all you need is just to add Jesus to your life to make it better. You love his teachings as long as they don't require anything of you. When confronted with dirty jokes, blasphemous language, and ideas that oppose the holiness of God, are you silent and you make no answer? Whatever you want to believe, believe it. But that's good for you. Or are you a limping Israelite? Or do you recognize or identify with Elijah, a lover of Yahweh, 
who courageously and boldly obeys God's word in defiance of circumstances and consequences. Get that again. He courageously and boldly obeyed God's word in defiance of circumstances and consequences. I don't care where I'm at. I don't care what's going on. I don't care if it's life or death. I'm going to boldly and courageously obey God's word. Do you trust that God will provide all that you need in times of plenty? as well as times of famine. Are you ready to serve and minister to those that are in need, whether they're of your family or not, of your race or not? Are you prepared to give a defense of God no matter the audience? Are you prepared and willing to go it alone against a culture that is hostile to your faith? Now in reality, you and I probably go through the spectrum of Elijah and King Ahab. I pray that you stepped away from King Ahab. I pray that you're not that. If not, would you repent and see that Christ will bring you as one of his own? But then at the worst, you and I are, are Obadiahs and, and, and the prophets of God in hiding. At the best, we're Elijah. So where do you find yourself? Probably facilitating between one or the other, depending on the circumstances, pretending or, or maybe on the consequences of what it may be. If you and I are honest, we must admit that our times of Elijah are few and far between. It's easy to do it here at church, Sunday school, small group. But how are you in the workplace, in the neighborhood, at Thanksgiving dinner with your family? I want to end today with a rebuke, a challenge, and a word of encouragement. Like Elijah, you and I must courageously and boldly obey God's word in defiance of circumstances and consequences. So here's the rebuke, and listen to these words with love. You and I must proclaim that God is the one true living God, and that one day he will judge the wicked and reward the righteous. <coughs> Yet too many times you and I have failed in this important ministry. We have not been courageous, nor have we been bold. We have succumbed to the fear of man over the fear of God. We have allowed the circumstances and consequences to mute our witness and our faith. We have feared that our loved ones, our friends, our co-workers, and our neighbors may align our character and worldview. We are fearful that they may ridicule our life choices and our beliefs and that they may ostracize us from the realm of the public square. In the Revelation, Jesus warned the church of Laodicea, I know your works. They are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, what does he say? Because you are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. There's the rebuke. Make a decision. Serve God or serve Baal. That's the choice you need to make. And I say some are here today that would say, yes, I'm a Christian, but you are serving the false gods. You need to repent and turn back to the one who's the true living God. Here's the challenge. As Christians, you and I are called out, or we are to call out and stand against the false gods of pursuing our own passions, dreams, and aspirations and pursue the things of Christ. We are to call out, stand against the false gods of personal fulfillment versus fulfilling the words of Christ. We are to call out and stand against the false god of tolerance of sin in our communities and in our lives. We need to stand and call out against the false god of self-satisfaction and self-accusation, and self-service. You and I are not called to serve as secret agents. Second Corinthians tells us, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of knowledge of him everywhere. I love this word picture. We are a fragrance for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So you and I are not secret agents who are hiding behind enemy lines. 
No, we're to be a fragrance, an aroma that when people step in our area of influence, they, they are drawn to that. To some, it says it's from life to life. To some, our aroma, our fragrance will be repellent because they will not abide the truth. We are men of sincerity, commissioned by God, that we may speak of Christ. Now this will not make us popular or win us many friends, however. God has called us to proclaim Christ crucified and to pronounce boldly the message of reconciliation. Paul wrote rightly when he declared in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of salvation to everyone. You and I must realize that. And you and I have that ministry of reconciliation. Christ is crucified. The, the, God is reconciling man to himself. John MacArthur in his book, Our Sufficiency in Christ, writes this, the message God has called us to preach is not designed to make sinners comfortable. I'll say it again. The message God has called us to preach has not, is not designed to make sinners comfortable. They will attack, or ridicule, malign, and try to take us out of society. But Paul wrote, do not be ashamed about the testimony of the Lord for whom I believe and I am convinced that he is able to guard us until that day. So here's the word of encouragement. Jesus has empowered us with his authority to be ministers of the reconciliation. Though you and I may, you and I may not see fruit in our lifetime or even in our sacrifice uh, right now, we see that God's word does not return void. Turn to Mark chapter 8, if you would, verse 34. Mark chapter 8. You and I must realize that God promises to guard us until that day he returns or he calls us home. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, we're very close here to the end. In this passage, Jesus gives a word of encouragement that comes in the form of a warning. Mark chapter 8, look at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, If anyone could come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give his return for, uh, return for his soul? For whoever, this is at verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. The reason Jesus could say this is because Jesus was Elijah. He stood alone despite the circumstances and the consequences. He was ready to go to the cross for you and I. He stood in the face of the one who said, what is truth? Jesus faced an enemy greater than Ahab, sin and death. He faced an adversary much more hostile than Queen Jezebel. And like Elijah, no one stood with him. Yet he boldly obeyed God's word despite the circumstances and consequences, and thereby securing our salvation and the glory to God. Choose you this day. Will you follow God? Or will you follow after the promises of the false gods? Which man will you be? Every head bowed and every eye closed as the worship team comes up. I want to take a moment to just to pause and consider God's word. To pray and ask the Spirit for the sermon to respond. Is it time to repent and turn towards Christ? Is it time to recognize that you've lived as a secret agent or one who's not been engaged? Have you been derelict in your duty in sharing the truth? Do you need to pray for more strength, for more courage? 
the stand against friends and loved ones and families that have been deceived by lies of Satan. That's a tough choice. Maybe your prayer this morning is just, Lord, give me courage. Give me courage to live for you. Whatever the Spirit may call you, we ask you to make that decision today. I'm going to ask Landon, our elder, to be up here at the end of the service. He'll be up here if you need prayer, if you have a question. Just want someone to pray with you. He'll be here at the end of the service. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love for us. Lord, let us see ourselves for who we truly are. Typically, we see ourselves much better, or sometimes we're very harsh on ourselves. But would your spirit just speak to our hearts? Expose the ways in which the fear of man prevents us from standing for the truth. And give us the courage and the boldness to obey your word, no matter the circumstance or consequence. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. To share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.